Hello, everybody, and welcome to Whale Whisperers. Uh, fantastic to have you with us this evening, this morning, this afternoon, in the middle of the night, wherever you are around the world. Uh, and uh, today we are going to be talking about responsible whale watching. What does it mean? And particularly focusing on guidelines uh, to responsible whale watching, which is uh, how we how we follow the animals, how we uh, the amount of time we spend with the animals, how far away we should be from the animals in the wild. Uh, and I'm really excited to, to have this discussion because it's fundamental, really, uh, to ensure that we have a minimal impact on whales and dolphins when we're when we're out on the ocean in the wild. And I'm very honoured uh, to have a distinguished team of expert whale and dolphin watching guides and whale watch owners with us uh, today. We have Rui Santos. Give us a wave, Rui. Uh, we have Lorenzo Fiori. Give us a wave, Lorenzo. And we have Angie Gullen. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you, for, for joining us on this uh, webinar. Really, really great to have you with us. Um, and we, we're going to talk about some of the issues and some of the challenges of, uh, of responsible whale watching practices. But first of all, let's go around our amazing dream team here and, uh, and find out a little bit more about them, where they come from, what kind of whale watching tours they run and, and what they're up to. So uh, perhaps we could start with Lorenzo. Lorenzo, welcome. Hi, nice to meet you, Dina, and thank you for introducing me. Uh, my name is Lorenzo uh, Fiori, and uh, I took uh, one year ago my PhD uh, looking at the responses of uh, humpback whales to swim with activities in, uh, in Tonga. And uh, since a couple of years, I work uh, in the Azores, in São Miguel, for, uh, to be precise, in Villa Franca do Campo, uh, for a company called Terra Azul, a whale watching uh, company. And uh, I basically supervise uh, the work of our biologist uh, team and our collaboration, of course, with uh, scientific projects and, uh, and all our operations at sea, including uh, whale watching uh, and uh, swimming with dogs. That's fantastic. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, I'm jealous already. Uh, <laughs> uh, Angie, Angie, welcome. Tell, tell us about what you're doing. Yeah, hi Dylan, hi everybody. Um, thank you for having me on board tonight. Um, yeah, so my name's Angie Gullen. I'm from Dolphin Encounters Research Center in Ponte de Oro, Mozambique. Um, I am in essence a citizen scientist um, and a guide. And uh, yeah, we developed uh, Dolphin Encounters in the mid nineties with the intention of developing a program that was ethical and sustainable, but that also funded uh, research and conservation. So right from the beginning, we put into place um, certain that we could collect data um, as well as putting in uh, quite a strict code of conduct, which obviously has evolved over the years as we've learned from the dolphins and as tourism has grown in the area as well. Um, yeah, so a couple of onshoots or, or offshoots, I should say, um, from dolphin encounters are regular beach cleanups. We work with the big microplastic surveys as well. Um, and also, yeah, various other things, a whole, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, thanks for, for, for me being here. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Angie. That's wonderful. Very, very impressive as always. Uh, Rui, Rui, how are you doing? Tell us about your, your background and who you're working for. Hello again, um, Dylan, Lorenzo and Angie. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, you guys also and welcome also to everybody that is listing us. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Um, I work for Futurismo and I'm also a, a PhD student from the University of Algar. So over the last 10 years, I have been working as a skipper and uh, um, we're watching guide in, in, the, in the Azores, mostly on, um, on Pico Island. Um, since the beginning that I collect uh, data for the, the company that now it will be actually part of my PhD studies uh, to try to understand distribution and abundance of uh, whales and dolphins around the uh, Pico Island. Um, of course, we try to follow guidelines. I'm trying already to introduce um, a little bit, um, but it's always possible to follow these guidelines. Are these guidelines always the, the best ones in the world for the animals? I mean, not for us. Uh, I just want to 
leave it like already with a question, Divin. Probably stepped a little bit on your shoes, but uh, just uh, a way to start, in my opinion. Uh, so, uh, so he's getting cheeky already. Yeah, that's quite right. And, and uh, you know, I guess what you're pointing to there, Rui, and thank you for, for that introduction, is that, um, you know, the world doesn't stand still and, and we, we, have to, we have to keep learning about these animals. And that's what's so, partly what's so fascinating about being able to work as a guide or to study them uh, from a research perspective is we, we can only build guidelines to minimize our impact based on our best understanding of these animals. And, and that has to come from the latest research. So uh, those two things are very much intertwined uh, I would say, but we can, we can, I'm sure Angie and Lorenzo will have their, their viewpoint on that. So we'll, we'll come back to that in more detail. Thank you. I'd like to start guys with, with just talking about whale watching in general and in particular, your views on its impacts because all forms of tourism um you know with wild animals uh, whether it be big game watching or bird watching or uh you know diving with sharks they all have an impact don't they they have an impact and i wanted to get your feeling on uh well the, either the research or, or your personal perspectives on on what impacts whale watching has uh, maybe we could start with uh, with Lorenzo. Okay. <laughs> How many hours do I have for this question? <laughs> so let's, uh, uh, in my opinion, I would call them uh, effects uh, more than impacts because most of the studies, I mean, now we have a huge body of literature, like 30 years at least of studies done on whale watching, especially, but also swim with dolphins and whales. And uh, Let's say that we can go from uh, short term behavioral changes can be avoidance, avoiding the boat or the people in the water to dramatic uh, um, interruption of uh, vital behaviors. It can be feeding, it can be resting, or socializing. And unfortunately, these uh, short term uh, uh, changes have been linked also to long term consequences that say that those are the real impacts such as like uh, decreasing the population in a local area that can be due to big boat pressure and the animals moving away or uh, having trouble reproducing themselves and having time to hunt and feed the calves. So the real uh, impact, uh, uh, it's a little bit hidden because it's difficult to assess on a long-term scale what's going on. But uh, let's say that the short-term studies are kind of uh, ringing bells that are telling us uh, to be precautionary in our approach because uh, of course, as you mentioned, uh, any kind of uh, activity, human activity in particular, what involves wildlife, it might have an effect and this effect they can be detrimental for the, for the animal. So yeah, we, we can reassume, uh, let's say the, all the effects that have been studied uh, like this. If I have to give an example of avoidance, I normally say that they have two ways to avoid us. One is vertical, so they dive longer or uh, deeper, <laughs> or uh, horizontally, they increase the speed, they start turning away and changing direction. And uh, these are clear signs that there's something going on. So, that's, yeah. That's, yeah, that's great, Ruin. And, um, you touched on this sort of precautionary approach. So, uh, sorry, Lorenzo, uh, that, that was really great. Rui, uh, Lorenzo touched on this precautionary approach that, that because we can't be sure of the long-term impacts that it's better to be as careful as, as possible. Would you, would you add anything to that? I think it, there's one important issue that is the time that whale watching spend with the animals. So we can, the, this like Lorenzo said, well, there's plenty of studies and, um, but the main part of them are from people that went on board of these whale watching boats or dolphin watching or dolphin swimming activities that are quite restricted in time. So imagine like Lorenzo mentioned, well, the, we interrupt a feeding behavior or we put swimmers in the, in the water when the, the dolphins are feeding. And lots of times I have witnessed they, they continue feeding. It's not because the people is there, but I witness also the people enter, they stop feeding and they go away. So 
but how you, can you actually measure that impact if after 30 minutes you go away and you don't follow the group with a scientific purpose to access to real access, even if we have 30 years of study, if any one of us or any study in the world had followed a particular bottlenose dolphin, and there's at least one that, from my knowledge, in Ireland, that every year there's people swimming with um, with that individual. But are these individual with the swimming or with the whale watching actually changing? Every time that you see a boat approaching the area, they change behavior. So are they? Are you 100% sure that they react all the time to the boat? And we are just looking to just to a glimpse of a day. So even how can we say that uh, Lorenzo mentioned they make a, a big dive? Uh, who knows if he goes down there because he likes to dive and come up is the way that he reacts to the, to the boat. Is this an avoidance? Or not? It seems that it is, and in my opinion, it will be that one. But we we cannot be locked. Or unfortunately, there are some locked species of uh, cetaceans. For um, but it's not like a, a monkey or a mouse that we can test and test and test with uh, with them. So these ecological and behavioral studies, even if they have a long term, I think there are so many ramifications. Is so hard to know from these social animals um, how we are truly impacting. That's why even if we have the guidelines, I think it depends in the end, in my opinion, and I'm also a skipper. So on the common sense of the skipper of that boat, when arrives to an area of an animal or a group of animals to realize, are we good in the presence, are we, making these animal behave so and do an avoidance to the boat, just go away. If they allow us to be there, just follow the guidelines, go up to the 30 minutes in the area. But in the end, I think the main decision, it goes to the skipper. And I will have you to, to go a little bit further because I think it's important we go and have the opinions of uh, other my, of my other colleagues on that also. Thank you, Rui. Yes, and you know we can see this is question one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and we can see how complicated. And to be fair, you know we're dealing not just with a, a, an industry which is 120 countries uh, with you know different um, different ways of, of running tours, different boats. Uh, we're also dealing with you know over 80 species of cetacean here so you know this this is this is not a one size fits all um methodology we're trying to come up with here which we are trying to minimize those impacts and clearly from what you both said so far um it is this is very very difficult to study these animals and we can see that the importance of long-term data sets really we touched upon this earlier didn't we really uh, when we did our whale watch virtual whale watch earlier long-term data sets you know and we're talking decades long really uh, is before we are really can often start to see um results that are meaningful and it just goes to show the importance of, of long-term research but uh, let me go to angie angie i'd love to get your take on this as well on the impacts of whale watching and your experiences in, in mozambique yeah thank you um yeah definitely we have uh, here in mozambique noticed the impacts of um too many boats in the area on our local population of dolphins so here in ponta we have um identified some 255 bottlenose dolphins out of that we've got a small uh, resident population of around about 60 dolphins so what we have definitely noticed in our we call them our silly seasons when it's really busy decembers and aprils a lot of boat traffic a lot of human swimmers we find that the dolphins tend to move out of the area or else they do tend to show us more um, avoidance behavior. So during those 
those periods, it is more unlikely that we actually get into the water and try and engage with them because of the behavior that they're showing us prior to us getting into the water. So um, yeah, we've definitely noticed uh, short-term uh, impacts in terms of them not being in the area and obviously long-term impacts after, you know, um, being able to have a look at the data long-term, we'd probably be able to get more results on that. Yeah. Fantastic. So, you know, yeah, we know there are- Dylan. Yes, go Lorenzo. Just uh, because I think we mentioned something really important that it's a matter about the exposure to the time that the boats spend with the animal, of course, because and this, I have to be preci more precise about how the, most of the studies on, uh, on uh, these animals, on behavior of these animals are done. It's not dependent on the web watching activity. Most of the time, there is a research vessel still with the animal or time or even land-based and observing this kind of uh, different parameters. So, so uh, of course, otherwise the study will not be published <laughs> in the first place. If we don't have a right control of the activity of the animal, and uh, we cannot compare with, uh, with other situations. And uh, of course, uh, to be the effects that uh, I mentioned are really different across different species. So, and places actually. There are a lot of variables in the fold uh, and it's very hard to generalize and to create global guidelines also from that point of view to bring to the next probably topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, agreed, Lorenzo, agreed, thank you. Um, I think whale watching is, is actually quite an unusual industry and, and some of our research over the last few years in which it, certainly for the world cetacean lights we've compared it with other forms of ecotourism uh, and actually it, it comes out really well um, in terms of the positive impacts the the good things that come out of whale watching uh, and, and the good things that many whale and dolphin watching companies do and i i've it's wonderful to talk to you guys. You're all World Cetacean Alliance partners, and I know that you're all doing fantastic work. And some of our whale watch and dolphin watching companies, in my view, could be charities. And some of you are charities as well, because you do so much positive work for the environment. So who, who would like to tell me a little bit about the positive impacts that whale watching can have? Angie. Yeah, um, so... Over, our, over all the years, I've definitely noticed that when people have a positive uh, experience with, um, with dolphins and with whales, it definitely changes them inherently. Um, when one undertakes a really good uh, pre-experience briefing and code of conduct and educational session, one also has the ability to teach people um, how they can be more sustainable in their own lives. And I think out of the entire experience, people can really come away with having learnt about how special marine mammals are and how special they can be in terms of assisting those marine mammals in their own lives. Even if it's a small little thing, you know, we all know the big plastic problem, but if it's a small little thing that they can stop using plastic from, from shops when they go shopping, at least that's a positive change that can come out of an experience. So I think education and conservation comes out of, um, a really close encounter with marine mammals in the wild. Yeah, I think that that's a really nice example. And yeah, we've got quite old data on this, but we know that at least 13 million people a year are going whale and dolphin watching. So that's a lot of people we can inspire to, to think about marine conservation and sustainability and those kind of things. Uh, Lorenzo or Hui, would you, would you add to that? Are there other ways in which whale watching is beneficial? I, uh, let me say that I agree totally with uh, Angie. And um, actually, I mentioned this on the lecture be before. Um, and I, I'm just going to make a comparison. It's, um, I would say that whale watching or looking to the whales and the dolphins for the guests that are coming all over the world, it's like um, when you go to a football day and it's passion that you bring. And so when we do, and um, I believe that all the partners from WCA for this, are for sure that Futurismo does, is we use this passion to pass a message that Angie is saying so clear, educational uh, way, a, a conservation 
way. And if you link this to these wildlife that are the cetaceans, um, people go home and uh, do small things as the plastic refer already and change a little bit. And I always say, if we change a little bit, we can do a lot. But if we protect the cetaceans, we're gonna protect also the other species. So in general, we are not just protecting cetacean, we are protecting biodiversity in general, that's the most important. And I think all of us um, work, uh, work for that, for everybody that comes with us, take a very good message home uh, about protecting wildlife in the end. Fantastic, thank you, Fui. Um, Lorenzo, uh, Lorenzo, maybe you could perhaps touch on, on how whale watching influences local communities. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? We have whale festivals around the world, for example. We need one here, probably. Yeah. <laughs> because I have to say that still, uh, and it's something that I observe in many places, in particular islands in the Pacific as well, in Tonga, the local communities, they kind of uh, know little sometimes about uh, all the species of animals that we have in our sea. Even though I have to say here in, uh, in the Azores, uh, uh, sperm whales in particular represented uh, an important resource back in the days of uh, whaling. But uh, it's kind of something almost that uh, some uh, local people want to forget. It's like uh, something reminding about war times where, uh, I mean, whaling was a terrible job, <laughs> to be honest. A lot of people died and, uh, and were uh, armed, especially because here in the Azores was conducted with uh, canoes. So it was still done in traditional way until the 1986 when it was banned. But uh, I think that um, that has a, a great a great potential also from the point of view of the local community because uh, I mean we live in a in a islands that are example of an incredible transition from uh, slaughtering them to building up an industry and uh, I have to say that here in particular a lot of uh, the companies are uh, local and they employ local people and. Uh, that's quite different in other places sometimes where we have more uh, foreign uh, uh, companies. So indeed it has a great value, uh, even in these times where tourism is, uh, has been hit quite hard. So I think uh, it, it, can be a, uh, it can be having a positive impact locally, but it's something that probably should be worked more uh, in, uh, in several places where I have been. Thank you, Lorenzo. So it's a, it, can, it can have a positive impact on local communities, but there's more work that we could do there, clearly, which is, which is quite exciting. Um, OK, so I, I, a, a very quick question for all three of you then. In one sentence, you can take a moment to think about this, but not too long because people might get bored. Uh, I want you to sum up what responsible whale watching is for you. If I were to say to you, define responsible whale watching or responsible dolphin watching uh, in one sentence this I know this is good for the for the Latin for the Latins amongst us this is always difficult to do one sentence uh, I'm going to start with Angie to give you a bit more time uh, gentlemen Angie what what can you get, give us here yeah, for me, responsible whale watching, and in my case, uh, dolphin swimming, is uh, putting the, the animals first. Um, at the end of the day, it's all about the animals. We always like to say that it's the dolphins that actually engage and encounter us. We are merely just the observers. So um, yeah, that's for me is the most important thing. That's a great summary. And, and in almost one sentence, thank you, Angie. Uh, Lorenzo. I can try with one word, <laughs> I can, and I'm Italian, so it's very hard for me. <laughs> it's a compromise, I believe. It's a compromise between uh, no interaction, no effect, leave them there to do whatever they want in the ocean and get to see them uh, without uh, trying to minimize uh, our presence there. And if you are a bird watcher, you should know what I mean. Birds that they don't like at all to be observed by us, and you will uh, start to disguise, to hide somehow. And I think it's the same way. Of course, they know you are there, especially very sensitive animals to the to noise as they are. I mean, if you are there with a boat, most likely they know you are there. 
but yeah, I think it's a, it's a kind of compromise. Uh, that's a, that's a great, it's a great answer. I really like that answer. I like the honesty of that answer. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, Rui. If you don't bother, I'm going to do a metaphor and I'm going to use my mother. Uh, so the dolphins and the whales are my neighbor. So my mother, when I was going to my neighbor's house, just, uh, just said, behave. That's what we need to do. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I might make all my questions one sentence answers. Do you guys are good at this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I really, really like those answers. Um, so let, let's let's talk a little bit about the rules then. What because for, for some people who are who are um, tuning in uh, to our webinar tonight, you know, they they might not be familiar that there are rules and guidelines that that we try to follow. Um, and of course, they, they are different in different parts of the world and they're different depending on the, the, the type of whale watching we're doing. If people can whale watch by aeroplane or helicopter, for example, they obviously mostly we do it based on, on boats of, of different shapes and sizes. And of course, uh, in some countries, there are uh, opportunities to swim with or, or be in the water, having water encounters with these incredible animals. Um, who we'll go to all three of you really perhaps but um could you just sum up um uh, maybe let's start with Rui could you sum up what whale watching guidelines are um I if I understood properly what you mean with that is uh, the way that we approach the um, the animal so we have a very restricted Portuguese law that uh, actually um, WCA, the guidelines that they have, it's very similar with uh, what we have to do. Um, but regarding one thing, like we already both of uh, all of us mentioned, is in the end, we need to respect the animals. So these guidelines of approaching behind, following the proper speeds, when you approach a group of for swimming, don't swim if there's newborns and uh, calves on the on the groups. Um, try to don't go faster than the speeds of the of the animals. Uh, don't cross the front of the of the group of one individual. All these guidelines. Um, in the end, imagine that you follow all of them, but if you feel that you are uh, creating a a bad situation, let's say it like this, to the animal, should we follow the guideline just it's because they are written to be like this or should we do something different like go away? Um, it's uh, that it's when we say law, guidelines, everything, but I think in the end goes, everything should finish with the respect to the, to the animals, in my opinion at least. Thank you, Furi. That I, I, who would not agree with that sentiment? Um, Angie, perhaps you could tell us, particularly from a, a swimming with perspective. Actually, actually, um, you know, getting into the water either with whales or dolphins. You can, you can, you can go and swim with, with, or certainly be in the water with, with both whales and dolphins in different parts of the world. Can you tell us a bit more about the guidelines for, for that kind of tourism? Yeah, um, obviously the guidelines have been put in place to safeguard the, the dolphins um, in, in, our, in our case. And um, basically one has to, you know, the other day I was chatting to somebody and we were talking about uh, dolphin whispering. And um, I, said to this, uh, I said to this lady, I really love the term dolphin and whale whispering because it kind of works on... Uh, it, it's a two par, you know, we, we like to say that we whisper, we talk to dolphins and whales, but actually when we're in the water, we need to approach them with a whisper kind of a, you know, in a kind of a way where we're really quiet and we're really just there to kind of observe them. So what we've done here in Pontedora over the years, as we've learned from the dolphins, we've 
put in different kind of guidelines, one of which is a no dive down policy. And for a lot of places that have swim programs, they do have a, a dive down policy with, uh, with dolphins and with whales. But what we found was when the tourism was really picking up here in Ponta, our quality of encounters was getting worse and worse. So we thought, okay, a, a better way for them is just to make sure that everybody kind of floats on the surface of the water, allowing clear passage for the dolphins. So I think each area is quite specific in terms of how you want to develop your code of conduct and your guidelines. But of course, guidelines are really important if you want to create a safe space between those animals and yourself. And it's the simple things like never reaching out to try and touch them. Obviously, the no swimming with newborns and no chasing as well. If the dolphins want to be in your space, they're going to be in your space. If they don't want to, we've got to just kind of say, c'est la vie, let them be, tomorrow's another day. Yeah. <clears throat> Fantastic. Thank, thanks, Angie. And Lorenzo, you, I mean, you, uh, I, you've had a wonderful career. You've had the opportunities to study and, and spend time with humpback whales in, in Tonga, I understand. And, there, and you know, now you're, you're based in the Azores and, and there's the opportunity to swim in the, in the deep blue North Atlantic Ocean with, with, uh, with various species of dolphins. How do you kind of compare those experiences and, and, and again, the importance of following guidelines? Uh, well, um, if you do, like consider guidelines like sort of boundaries and especially in the water is a little bit difficult to, to imagine these boundaries, but uh, because we are used to live on land, of course, and uh, the space these animal need sometimes uh, it's very different from uh, what we interpret as uh, space, especially when you look at different species. So when I studied humpback whales in Tonga, we actually have serious accidents because someone tried to touch the animal and was not ready to move away, interpreting the behavior of the animal that was not playful at all, but was more defensive aggressive. So. It's important to read this kind of, uh, of uh, behaviors, but uh, of course we need to be educated to understand these behaviors. Uh, and uh, So that's why the guidelines uh, relative to different type of animals are really important uh, and uh, has to be communicated in a briefing really clearly because nobody comes uh, generally with the knowledge of uh, how a humpback whale will perform uh, a tail uh, trash. <laughs> at you. <laughs> so there are signs of this kind of interaction and it's very important, of course, also the knowledge of the crew operator in interpreting this. When it comes to dolphins, I have to say uh, it's even more complicated and different because I've seen, uh, I've worked also in research projects in uh, New Zealand uh, where they swim with dusky dolphins and I've seen uh, how the activities conducted there. I've seen the activity conducted here with uh, common dolphins. Atlantic spotted dolphins, autonomous dolphins, and even research dolphins sometimes. And all of them, they have a totally different behavior. We actually have the striped dolphins. It's impossible to get in the water with them. They are just proposing at full speed, deep diving and disappearing. And uh, so uh, it's very complicated to, uh, to have uh, a single answer for your, for your question. And uh, that's again, uh, the thing that I was mentioning before, every case has to be taken really carefully, case by case, species by species, and figure out what is the best way to, uh, to interact, of course, in a respectful way. I totally agree with what was mentioned before by Andy and Louis. So yeah, it's an hard task, especially when it comes to getting the water with them. Let me just add uh, a few things to what Lorenzo said that uh, I agree totally with him. And just going in one species, Riso dolphin, that he just mentioned that very rarely in San Miguel, they swim with them and they are very hard to swim. But if you go to Pico and in Pico Island, you had some resident groups um, that let me say, probably they are the easiest ones to swim. You know exactly what, they, what they're gonna do and you can do the, in my opinion, the best approach with the best impact possible. So it's not just the species are different, the groups are different, the individuals are different. So this, again, 
just saying the guidelines are like this for this species or it's the guidelines for a group of species is so, so hard to, to evaluate and that I think the moment that we make the activity, it's the goal. That's why I mentioned already before that the skipper decision in the end to try to minimize the impact uh, relies on him, at least in my opinion. Absolutely, and let we, we I, I, I'm hearing you very strongly there, Rui, and I, I, I agree with you. That's this um, the experience, at, you know, field experience, or at time, you know, time spent at sea with the animals' experiences is so fundamental in passing that knowledge, you know, to the next group of naturalists, the next group of skippers, is actually something that in the industry we don't do anywhere near enough, and. Um, you know, I have to say that from, from our, my perspective and from the World Cetacean Alliance's perspective, you know, we have a, a set of global guidelines for whale and dolphin watching, as you know, and for swimming with whales and dolphins. And for years, I was totally against that very approach. I, di I didn't want us to do it um, because we've got 80 plus species, because every different place and every different group of animals uh, you know, it is different. And so therefore, would creating this set of global guidelines actually improve the industry and improve the, the, the situation for whales and dolphins around the world or not? In the end, we decided that it could be done, but only under very specific uh, circumstances. We needed, we needed these guidelines to be flexible uh, and we needed to be able to continually adapt and improve them. And I think uh, hopefully, hopefully we've got it right, but I think we still have much to learn. Um, but one thing the science is telling us, I think, um, is that guidelines are much better than not having guidelines. So, you know, there, 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 there are, uh, yeah, this is an important point really, because it might seem like an obvious one, but currently we have a, a big whale watching industry around the world. And in many, many places, there are either no guidelines or guidelines exist and they're, and they're not followed. Or we have a lot of places where guidelines are followed by some of the operators, but not by all. And we come on to this later because it's important for the tourists and customers to know how to find the, the responsible operators. So, you know, it, it is a complicated situation, but I think we can have some confidence that um, we know that these animals are intelligent and where they are seeing tour operators and boats on a frequent basis, they learn uh, those that are at least following a set of rules and, and they, they start to understand that an approach is made in a certain way that they, the boat, which they recognize individual boats, we know that from the sounds of those vessels, will act in a certain way. And like us, they get to know the good people from the, from the, from the ones that will act irresponsibly because they're unpredictable. That, that's my interpretation very broadly of, of, of the way the research has gone and, and, and our understanding. Um, but clearly it's difficult to apply the guidelines, isn't it? Because all of, all of the different locations and the animals uh, are so unique. And I just wanted to get your perspective um, on how you, you know, practically how realistic it is to apply the, the guidelines and, and how you've been able to do it yourselves. And, and I'll come to you, Rui, last, because I know that you'd like to bring in the skipper element, and I think that's important. Uh, but let me start with Lorenzo. Um, from the whale watching perspective, uh, uh, I had to say that uh, in the case of, uh, of the Azores, uh, where I am at the moment, uh, I found uh, basically that it was quite easy to, uh, to, to follow the guidelines uh, uh, from WCA. And um, I have to say that uh, the company already before was following a similar code of conduct because to be honest, the hard law in Portugal is quite dated. I think we are talking about 2003. So, and it's a little bit gray in some areas. So from the point of view of well watching, I had reviewed the guidelines with skippers and with uh, guides uh, with a lot of years of experience. And uh, it's kind of easy. From the swim with dolphin perspective, uh, and that's where they had to be adapted a little bit more. 
um, especially because of the particular type of dolphins that we have in the area. We are talking about uh, mainly oceanic species uh, that we swim with, particular common dolphins. And I think it's one of the few places in the world where uh, common dolphins are actually uh, they a species of focus of this industry. So uh, it, it can be quite complicated. Uh, and uh, there are several situations in which uh, we have uh, many, many calves. We are actually collaborating with a research project using drones to look at the group behavior and uh, social uh, strategies also in response to both approach. And from the drone perspective, it's amazing what is going on. And uh, we can count all the little calves. I, in a pod of 70 animals, 19 calves, for example. So it's a big nursery. And uh, yeah, we are looking into to a lot of things that we know already from experience and try to adapt the guidelines there. But uh, yeah, it's the most complicated part, I have to say. And as you mentioned, I think they can be refined. And uh, but uh, yeah, it's better not to better to have guidelines instead of not having, of course. <laughs> totally agree with that. Thanks, Lorenzo. And Angie, what's your take on this? Uh, is it is it is it possible to apply swim with dolphin guidelines, or is it just not practical when it comes down to? when you're on a boat or suddenly in the water with the animals? Yeah, um, look, I think it's definitely possible to apply the um, we have seen We have seen them being applied here in, uh, in Pontador in our area. Um, obviously, there are situations that occur in the water where all of a sudden a female will arrive on the scene with her newborn, um, simply because she's known you the rest, you know, most of her life and vice versa. So when situations like that occur, that makes it a little bit difficult. But when you're on the water on the boat, you can make sure that you enforce those guidelines. So you come across a pod and there's a newborn there, you are not going to get into the water and swim with them. You're going to move on. But like I say, there are occasions when those females will bring them in as an introduction. Um, if we have a look at Mozambique in a, it, 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 in a whole, it was only a couple of years ago that Mozambique started recognizing marine mammal tourism pretty much as a standalone activity. We're quite, quite fortunate here in our Pontadora Partial Marine Reserve. We got the reserve proclaimed in 2009, and then government recognized dolphin swimming and uh, whale viewing as a standalone activity. Prior to that, though, everything was kind of lumped in together, and there was no set code of conduct or guidelines. So fortunately, over the years, we've now managed to work with government to start implementing codes of conduct and guidelines along the entire coastline, which I think is the ultimate goal, 2,500 kilometers of coastline. We definitely do need some protect, protection for our marine mammals. So yeah, I think it is possible, but again, it's a very area and species specific. Thanks, Angie. That's great. And Rui, I know you want to link the, the guidelines and the guides to the skippers. Tell us more. And I would like just to mention a, a few more things and look to the, to the Azers example. So till the end of the, the 90s in the Azers, it was possible to anyone swim with, uh, with whales. And now you need a, a special authorization for that, for movies or science. Um, until that time, when the Azorian or the Azorian companies, uh, with a, a few being more important on that matters than probably others, um, but with these following guidelines, they stopped the swimming with, with whales. And what that meant was the loss of the biggest market that they had were, at that time was the American market disappeared, basically, or almost totally. But the truth is, continue developing and developing and is recognized worldwide um, to be a place to do responsible whale watching. So we can, from the Azor saying, it's possible to enjoy the presence of the animals, following the rules, let's say it like, uh, like this, and um, the tourists will know about this. And I think there's one particular thing, and now going to the skippers, that I call the pressure. When anyone goes out 
to the sea. Let me say from my own experience, I'm the one that want the most to show the animals. And when I show them, I, it's like a relief of adre adrenaline. I have done my work properly. So I think what it's need for the future, for the guidelines, but mostly for teach our tourists, our guests that come with us is you are going out to look to wildlife. Just being the boat should be a good experience. So try to reduce the pressure that it's put by the company itself, by me that I love to see all the animals I want to see and show the maximum amount of uh, individuals and species in, uh, in one trip to give the best experience ever to, to everyone. But then if we try to take out this pressure that sometimes exists, um, I would say from the company, from ourselves, from the, the guests and just go out and be relaxed. And I'm gonna give an example and we were just talking before the, we start uh, that uh, Lorenzo saw a couple of days ago, some orcas in San Miguel, our company. So also, and so it was very easy to then put on social media this, um, but because the orcas are so rare for a very experienced skipper, he's gonna behave in a different way to show the orcas that he's gonna behave with a common dolphin group that he sees uh, or common dolphin species that he sees basically every day. So this pressure factor, um, I think it's bad for everyone. So if we manage, and I think it will be something, I think in the future, how can we put this in the guideline to try to erase this pressure to be more conscious tourists, to be more conscious keeper, more con conscious owner of the, of the company. I think the best for sure to have tourists coming because they know that is a good place to enjoy wildlife and the people working on the company, they will do their best to show them, but always respecting the animals. I think in the end, that's, I don't know if it's too much a topic, but I hope that in the future can be possible. And that, that you make a very important point there, Rui, because, um, and this is going back to experience, isn't it? Because I have been on, sadly, many whale watching trips in different parts of the world where the, the boats and the skippers are actually harassing the animals. I mean, you know, they're chasing them. They are chasing them around. And but but customers don't realize that's what's happening. And they might see dolphins jumping around or a whale slapping its tail and it's exciting. And if you don't have that knowledge and experience to understand and interpret, you know, and it's always our interpretation, but to interpret what might be stress on the animals in some way, then it's, 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 it's easy for those boat operators and those companies keep selling tickets and still get good reviews because of that lack of, of a more in-depth knowledge. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I'm gonna just mention one behavior. And then I think Lorenzo and Angie will agree with me on that. If we see, we approach a whale and if we see a whale low tailing a lot of times, one interpretation for at least I have done quite a few times is that the animal could be stressed by the presence of the, of the boat. And I remember to, to think on that because it was uh, with an ambeck whale, it was diving several consecutive dives. Um, and when I was approaching, was doing this, it did more one or two and then start to walk tail just after a few minutes after I, I arrived and I was basically deciding to leave. And I said, okay, we are leaving the area because it could be in response to us be here while telling it's great because everybody's taking a perfect picture. The animal is showing so much and, but was possible that was responsible to us. And then um, <laughs> I was almost doing a, using the bad words, but basically the animal poo 
and then continue to do what was doing before we arrived. So it's so hard sometimes, and I have seen so many species so many times, and um, it's again to the my my main point: a skipper decision and a skipper analysis of the the behavior at that moment. And you can be totally wrong. That's the truth. But the, by your conscience, if you do what you believe that is the best for the animal to protect them, I think nobody can be uh, asked that that's your fault of changing tremendously the, the animal behavior. Yeah. And I, I absolutely so. Yeah, thank you, Huey. So my interpretation is kind of going back to what we said before. The animal animals should always come first and be try to be respectful at all times. So with that in mind, then, and I, I want to come on to a couple of questions from from the audience. Please do post a question in the Q and A, and I, I will we'll get to two or three before the end. But if we can take uh, Angie and, and Lorenzo in a slightly different direction with all of your experience. I wondered if you could just, just think back to all those wonderful encounters that you've had, you lucky people. Uh, and, and maybe is, is there one or is there an encounter that stands out where you think, do you know what? We just got it right today, you know, and the animals were so relaxed and they had control of the encounter. You know, they really came to us. Angie's nodding her head, so I'm going to go to Angie first. Yeah, Dylan, interesting that you say that because today was actually one of those days, you know. Um, we got out there, um, we had just launched, um, before we had actually pushed the boat in, our, our skippers were on the beach and they'd actually seen some dolphins come through the surf, so we kind of knew in which direction to go. And as we were out there, they came straight to the boat and then they were literally just milling around the boat. And as we got in the water, they were all around us and it was a small group of people. We were no, no more than eight people in the water and just kind of hanging on the surface carry on and do a little bit of socializing amongst themselves and then come back to us. And this went on and off, on and off for about 30 minutes. So in that particular situation, you could definitely see 100% these, these dolphins were completely okay with us there. And, you know, I really do think that it is a lot to do with your con consistently following the same code of conduct and the dolphins knowing what to expect from you. So I think this is really important and understanding their behavior. Like yesterday we launched, we saw two pods of dolphins, they did long dives, they didn't approach the boat. So we knew in that situation it wasn't gonna work, but today everybody was smiling. So um, yeah, absolutely. You definitely know when they want to engage and when they don't. And it comes, it does boil down to experience 100%. Fantastic. Thanks, Angie. And, 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 and such respect for the way you run your operation, because I know I know of disappointed customers who, who've, who've gone out and not been able to swim with animals that have been there. Uh, but it's because it wasn't the right moment. And you know that through, through your experience. And I say disappointed in a good way, because because they understood as well that they can't necessarily do it every time. And I, I I think that's a wonderful way of running the, running the tours. Um, Lorenzo, did something uh, come to mind? Oh, uh, actually many, <laughs> many encounters come to mind. I tend to remember uh, when we get things wrong more than might be my supervisor role, but um, I think, uh, I think, uh, I had several times with uh, more recently here in the Azores with the sperm whales that are sometimes quite uh, quite difficult to uh, to interpret their behavior because uh, <laughs> uh, mostly we see them logging at the surface and foraging. Uh, but uh, we had a particular case in which we were listening with the hydrophone which is a thing that I strongly recommend to do because uh, it really adds another perspective uh, uh, to the whole experience. Understanding what is going on from the acoustic of these animals is just amazing. Just today, we heard like uh, some shotguns from a male of, sp of sperm whale. And that was the first time I heard it my myself in first person. It was incredible. And uh, yeah, we got actually three juveniles uh, investigating our hydrophone. <laughs> 
And we actually have underwater footage of this, and it was absolutely incredible. Like, um, of course, we we were kind of interacting with them, of course, but it was more like they were interacting with us. And uh, yeah, they were both visually and uh, acoustically, literally uh, making a sound like into the hydrophone, probably trying to understand what the hell was the thing. And I don't exclude they were even able to hear themselves through our speakers because they were quite close. So yeah, every time I, I have these kind of experiences, I have a new research question that pops up in my head. Like, so yeah. This is a very nice experience, I remember. <laughs> and for sure, the, it, was, it was a good approach, let's say, from them. <laughs> that, that's amazing. And that's nice, isn't it? Yeah, that we, you, you know, you're both talking about animals really approaching you, and it's on their terms, and they could turn away any moment and do their own thing, but they're choosing not to. It's giving, giving the animals the choice in their own environment. Um, wonderful stories. That, thank you both. Um, we've only got a few minutes. We might run over slightly by a couple of minutes if you guys can can cope with that. Uh, but I'd love to get a couple of questions in. Fantastic. Thank you uh, from from our audience. Thank you for sticking with us, everybody. Um, let me just uh, pick up on a question here. So this is from Anne. Um, is there also research on the impact of vessel noise on cetaceans with more whale tourism around the world? I think there's also more noise underwater and I wonder if this effect is being researched. Who would like to pick up on that? Uh, um, oh, sorry, Lorenzo, Lorenzo? It's fine, Rui. You can uh, you can start. Uh, me, I might uh, add uh, a little uh, bit of a recent publication later. <laughs> okay, so by far, I'm not an uh, acoustic expert. I can track a sperm whale more than ten kilometers away and uh, be on the side of that animal, but I'm not uh, an acoustic expert. Um, but let me say that probably now. From the last years, and I believe that uh, from the last year, um, it will come, I'm almost sure of that, studies that will understand that question of M. Why? Because it was not just the whale watching that had reduced a lot. You have all the ship traffic had been reduced dramatically due to COVID. So there's a lots of studies with fixed hydrophone a little bit all over the world. And I think it will be very important now to compare the data before COVID and with the COVID situation. And that, I think this address to this new data that we have from this last basically year um, will answer how much the impact it's big on these animals. We know that they are sensible to the sound. We know all of this, but now we had reducing more than 50% the, all the ships and all the whale watching all over the world. So the ones that were recording, and fortunately in the Azores, they do it, but I know that in also in the other parts in the world. So I believe that the next studies that will come up in the next two, three years that will compare before and after COVID will give, uh, I'll say a more precise answer to this, um, to this impact of, um, of whale watching and on the ship uh, traffic on, the, on cetaceans. I, I think we haven't give a proper look to that. And I believe that now we have that opportunity. Thank you, Hui. And, and that actually segues very well into a question from Tasha. Um, which is also, let me just read it, with a, with a lack of tourism during lockdowns, have you noticed more whales and dolphins on outings? So that's really, really a similar, similar point, really, whether um, during lockdown we've given the uh, cetaceans a bit of a break um, and uh, what the impacts of that might be and, and whether that's been noticeable. Angie or Lorenzo, have you, have you also noticed any changes? Very early to tell, I imagine. Um, 
the, the first time we came out of lockdown, just interestingly enough, uh, the first launch that we did, we were all super, super disappointed because we thought we were going to have the most amazing dolphin encounter, but needless to say, there wasn't a dolphin in sight. Um, but what I'm what I can say is that we did have a phenomenal, um, uh, you know, land-based whale viewing. So we weren't, weren't uh, doing any uh, uh, boat-based viewing last year because of COVID, but um, my early morning walks found a lot of humpback whale uh, sightings, whereas the previous year we had a lot less sightings. So at this stage, you know, as Rui was saying, the research is still going to be pretty early in terms of um, uh, seeing what the impact was during, you know, pre and post COVID in terms of uh, boat traffic and that. But um, yeah, we definitely noticed a lot more humpback whales inshore last year when there was no tourism. But at this stage, we can't say if it was um, directly related or not. Understood. Thank you, Angie. And Lorenzo, did you have anything to add? No, I think uh, I totally agree with Angie and, uh, and, uh, and Rui. And uh, well, for the particular situation here in the source, uh, I also think that there are a lot of different uh, factors that influence the passage of animals or the presence of animals here, especially for migratory species. So it's probably early to tell, uh, and uh, it would be quite complicated to, to prove. <laughs> but uh, let's see, let's see. And uh, as for the acoustic studies, I have to say that uh, only fairly recently there was something done, uh, looking in particular of the noise produced by whale watching vessels. They even did a study on ambequils with recording from whale watching vessels. They did a study with the real whale watching vessel with noise. Uh, workers, but uh, of course other type of noise was more documented to affect their behavior, but uh, I think uh, that's the direction to go because I believe the noise impact in the water is one of the most detrimental one for these animals, more than the visual, view, of course. They live in a very uh, complex soundscape, let's say. And when we make a lot of noise in it, and I'm talking also about cargo ship uh, and all these kind of uh, big uh, ship vessels, uh, it makes a big impact, of course. Together with sonar uh, and other uh, military exercise and so on, where we already know the effect, in particular, big at whales. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Lorenzo. And I, th you know, one of the one of the conversations that we need to have across the whale watching industry much more is is uh, how we move from being a carbon burning industry primarily because the vast majority of the industry is obviously still using fuel and with that comes noise as well so it, it hopefully as we as we move away to you know electric and solar and other energy uses that we have an opportunity to to also have less of a sound impact on our oceans. And I think that's going to be a Im very important discussion over the, over the coming years. Um, well, we have just slightly passed over the hour mark. Um, so I think we will uh, sum up. Uh, I will do so. I, I just want to say thank you so much to Hui, to Angie and to Lorenzo. Absolutely wonderful to speak to you both. I have learned much over the last hour and I hope our our watchers and listeners have too. Thank you so much to our participants. Please go out, out and tell your friends and colleagues to join uh, Whale Whisperers this week. There are other uh, great activities, other talks with expert guides and Lorenzo is joining us again, for example, on Wednesday to run a virtual whale watch in the Azores. Uh, very excited about that. Um, so yeah, we look forward to welcoming you to future sessions over the course of this week. This session about responsible whale watching is uh, chapter two in our new online responsible whale watching guides course, which we thoroughly recommend. Go to the WCA website uh, and go to uh, the guides course section, uh, which is in the get involved section. And uh, all of these webinars are free, but if you have the opportunity and can afford to make a small donation to the World Cetacean Alliance, please do so. We 
count every penny and make it work as, as hard as we can. Or join us. The WCA is the world's largest marine conservation partnership. You can join us as an individual, uh, as well as a whale watching company or as an NGO, a nonprofit. Uh, and we'd love you to be part of this amazing network and, and get involved and support and help wonderful people like the people we've been speaking to tonight. Uh, we will be uh, sending out a recording of this video um, uh, in the next couple of days, so you can catch up and share as well. So look out for that on our Facebook page. And I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or good night. Thank you so much to the team. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>